title of our message today is Our Book, Part 21. I pause here because there's probably going to be a, this is going to be Revelation 6, 12 through 13, and we're probably going to have an A and a B, maybe even a C, before we get to move on, and you'll see why as we go along. Revelation 6, 12, I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. The sixth seal, of course, covers the sixth church, the Philadelphian church, and the time frame was 1798 to 1844, getting close to our day, and you'll see more about that as we go along. Remember, this is the church that Jesus has no criticism for. It is almost the remnant, the church of Philadelphia. Brotherly love, one step away from agape love. Almost the remnant. What Jesus showed us, of course, was agape love. And now the church wants Having that, Ephesus, Smyrna, we've already covered that. They had, that was the original church that Jesus planted. Then it went into apostasy and heresy. But gradually the Holy Spirit was bringing it back. And now it is the church of Philadelphia. One step away from agape. I looked when he opened the sixth seal and behold there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. Pray with me. Father, as we look into your word, we recognize our tremendous need of your guidance. We know that your Holy Spirit is here. You promised you would always be here when we gather in your name, when we open your word, when we look to you for guidance. You promised you would never leave us, never forsake us. And today we call upon you to guide our thoughts. Give us clarity of understanding. I pray that you'll not allow me to interfere with your message. I mean that sincerely. Please allow your words to flow across my lips. Please touch my heart. Please touch my understanding as you do for each one here. In Jesus' name, amen. In the middle of the 18th century, Lisbon was one of the five largest cities in Europe. As a harbor town, Portugal's capital was an important hub in the trade between the Old World and its colonies. The 275,000 inhabitants of this proud and extremely wealthy city were devoutly Catholic. And many expositors of prophecy have named this earthquake as the fulfillment of that prophecy. However, it appears in the wrong period of church history. It happened in the middle of the 18th century. And as we've already seen, that doesn't quite fit. No wonder that all of the 40 cathedrals and churches in town were filled to the brim on All Saints Day in 1755. During Mass, Exactly at 9.40 a.m., the city was suddenly, violently shaken by seismic waves generated during the biggest earthquake the European continent has seen in historic times. It was felt in Finland. That's like an earthquake in California rattling the dishes in New York City. Hard to comprehend, but that's how big it was. Thirty churches, many palaces, and countless houses collapsed. Those people who were not killed outright or trapped in the rubble ran down to the quays along the Tejo River, only to be swept away by one of the largest tsunamis ever generated in the Atlantic Ocean. Its 20-foot waves destroyed everything in the lower part of the city. But this happened in the Sardis period of church history. Remember, Sardis ended in 17. 98, and this happened in 1755. Fires consumed what was left 
standing on the hillsides. The casualties of this quake and its aftermath were never counted, but at least 60,000 people lost their lives. Today we know that this quake had a magnitude of almost nine, stronger than any Tembler California has experienced since Spanish settlers arrived here. In other words, in recorded history. But it was 43 years before the deadly wound, which tells me there's going to be another one. Now, the way this has been handled, and I, I can't say for sure that it's wrong, but people have taken the position that the time wasn't all that exact, and so even though it happened during the Sardis period, it was close to the Philadelphian period, so it counts. And, and we've had, I've, I've heard it preached that way many, many times. And if, it was, if we were talking about the line of demarcation between uh, Thyatira and Sardis, I would go along with that. Because as I've already stated, that line is kind of fuzzy. Sardis is really just more of the same. It's Thyatira on steroids. So it was just, just more of the same, only greater. And, and I could see where, yeah, it wasn't a, wasn't a sharp line. But when you're talking about Sardis to Philadelphia, that line is pinpoint accurate. It was when the Pope was captured by General Berthier at, at Napoleon's bequest, and he died in prison. That was the end of the 1260-year prophecy. That was a, a year that we just can't move around. And so there's another way to look at this. And I'm not going to be able to resolve it for you today. Um, there's just there's too much ground to cover. Primarily, today, we're laying the groundwork. And next week, I will give you what I believe is the Bible answer to this conundrum. But I wanted you to be aware that it is a conundrum. I don't, I don't want to pretend like this is, uh, you know, this is just the way it is and, and we move on. I want you to know this is something that has to be considered. This earthquake seems to fit the requirement of the prophecy, but it came 43 years too soon. And so there has to be, I believe, another way to understand it. Also, the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. The dark day, you can find it in an encyclopedia, May 19, 1780, still in the Sardis period. The earliest report of darkness came from Rupert, New York, where the sun was already obscured at sunrise. Professor Samuel Williams observed from Cambridge, Massachusetts. This extraordinary darkness came on between the hours of 10 and 11 a.m., and continued till midnight of the next night. So, more than 24 hours. Reverend, Reverend Ebenezer Parkham of Westboro, Massachusetts reported, peak obscurity to occur by 12, but did not record the time when it first arrived. At Harvard College, the obstruction was reported to arrive at 10.30 a.m., peaking at 12.45 p.m., and abating about 1.10 p.m., but a heavy forecast remained for the rest of the day. The obstruction was reported to have reached Barnstable, Massachusetts by 2 p.m., with peak obscurity reported to have occurred at 5.30 p.m. Roosters crowed, woodcocks whistled, frogs peeped as if night had fallen at 2 p.m. in Ipswich, Massachusetts. A witness reported that a strong, sooty smell prevailed in the atmosphere and that rainwater had a light film over it that was made up of particles of burnt leaves and ash. Contemporaneous reports also indicated that ash and cinders fell on parts of New Hampshire to a depth of six inches. So obviously the obscurity was from a fire, a forest fire, and it was indeed dark. But this was 18 years before the end of the Sardis period of church history which tells me it will be repeated. This will happen again. Not necessarily with a forest fire, but there will be another dark day. In Revelation 6, 12 again, the moon became like blood. This happened the night before the dark day. It 
It's reported. You can find it in your encyclopedias. You can go to Google. Google will bring this up. And in verse 13, the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. This was November 13, 1833, 35 years after the deadly wound. So now we're in the right period of church history. This does not have to be repeated, although it may be repeated, but at least it qualifies for fulfillment of that prophecy. Though meteor showers are common, no one predicted the explosion of shooting stars that illuminated the night sky on November 12, 1833. Just before dawn, people threw on clothes and gathered in rows and fields to watch. The 150,000 plus meteorites, about 30, uh, 30 per second. Think about that for a second. 1,001, there were 30 meteorites when I said that. 1,002, 30 more. 30 per second dance in plain view during the storm's peak. One eyewitness told the Pantograph newspaper in Illinois that the very heavens seemed to be ablaze. Bible prophecy is world history in advance, which means that somewhere along the way, you move from past to future. And we have arrived at that point. We are there in this prophecy. Now, that raises all kinds of questions, I realize, because I've already told you that this period ended in 1844. So how can we be there? Again, you're going to have to be here next week. I, I, I can only lay the groundwork for the answer. I don't have time, unless you want to give me two hours to preach today. I don't have the time to uh, answer that question as yet. There are, however, some things we must understand before we venture any further in the book of Revelation. Because of our free will, things don't always go according to plan. And again, that statement is not going to be understood today. You'll have to come back next week or log on to Facebook or listen on the radio. So let's look at the plan. Let's take a look at what the Bible's plan looks like. The Old Testament sanctuary taught the gospel. The table of showbread was a symbol for Jesus, the true bread of life. And he said this when he was here. He told us he was that bread of heaven, that bread of life. The golden incense altar, the symbol for the prayers of the saints, ascending on high, accompanied with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, translating them into the language of heaven, all symbolized right here in that little article of furniture. The seven-branch candlestick, a symbol for Jesus, the light of the world, and the Holy Spirit flowing through the Gospels into the world. That golden candlestick is where we're going to focus our attention for a while. So let's look at the instructions God gives regarding its construction. In Exodus 25, verse 31. Now you're going to have to put your thinking caps on. If you fall asleep, or if you doze off, or if you just lose focus... You're not going to follow this. So please stay with me. God is talking to Moses. And God says, You shall also make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be of hammered work. Its shaft, its branches, its bowls, its ornamental knobs and flowers shall be of one piece. Pure gold. Hebrews 4.15 For we do not have a high priest, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. We actually had this verse in our Sabbath school lesson this morning. In all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. You may be asking yourself, I know for a long time I asked myself, how is that possible? How could Jesus be tempted the way we are today, with everything that we have assaulting us today. Uh, you, you look at the internet, you look at Hollywood, you, you look at billboards, you look at magazine articles, you, you know, whatever you look at today, this society is saturated with temptation. If I'm lying, tell me, stand up and tell me. 
Don't be bashful. I'm not lying, am I? This society is saturated with temptation. And I'm sure there was temptation in Christ's day too, but how could it possibly be that he was tempted in all points like we are? Well, it's really very simple, and I had a sermon on this not long ago. And it's archived on Facebook if you would like to go listen to it. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he didn't, you see, at Calvary, he didn't die for generic sin. He died for specific sin. And when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying to his father, please let this cup pass from me. The weight of our sins was pressing upon him. And he fought every battle that you and I lose. Every battle that we lose, he fought it right there in the garden. He wasn't sweating great drops of blood because he knew he would die the next day. There are people on death row who know they're going to die the next day. They don't sweat blood. He was sweating great drops of blood because of the agony of our guilt, our shame, pressing upon Him. All of the things that we fail, every temptation that we lose, He won. He won it that night. He was indeed tempted in all points, just exactly as we are. Because he fought every temptation during that night of agony. And when he went to Calvary, he carried that with him. He carried the weight of our guilt, our shame, our discouragement. I think I told you last week, if it wasn't last week, it was the week before. But you will never in your entire lifetime, ever commit one single sin that Jesus hasn't already paid for. And He loved you while He was paying for it. Don't ever let the devil tell you that your sin is too much for God. That He can't love you anymore because of the way you are. No, He died for you because of the way you are. He was paying the, the penalty of that sin specifically, not generally. This was not generic sin. No, it was your sin. It was my sin. It was specific sin. And that's exactly what this verse is telling us. And that's why he is pure gold. He is without sin, and yet he paid for all sin. Pure gold. You shall also make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be of hammered work. If you saw the movie, The Passion of Christ, you know that we didn't make it easy for him to save us. He was indeed hammered work. Flogged. The 39 save one was the death decree, or was the decree up to death. It didn't really mean 39 exactly. Flogging wasn't a certain number of lashes. There was a whip with leather thongs and pieces of metal and bone tied to it so that every time the soldier would hit you with it, it would cut and tear your flesh. And his job was to keep hitting you until he thought one more time he dies. It might take 38, it might take 43, but whatever that Roman soldier thought it took, when he decided, when that Roman soldier decided, one more time, he's dead. Then they quit. I was done to Christ twice, at least, possibly three times. The reading of scriptures allows for three times. He was indeed hammered work. Again, Exodus 25, 31. 
you shall also make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be of hammered work, its shaft, its branches, its bowls, its ornamental knobs and flowers shall be of one piece. One piece. Acts 14, 12. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. I've heard this verse misused so many times I, I, can't, just, I can't just move along. I have to stop and comment. It's not saying that you have to know the name of Jesus. If that were what it was saying, that would mean that God, a God of love, has written off whole civilizations who never heard the name of Jesus. It does not mean that. What it means is, everybody who receives salvation, everybody who's ever been born into the human family, every member of the human race, has an opportunity for salvation because of this sacrifice. There is no other way to salvation than through this sacrifice. But the Holy Spirit works upon the hearts and minds and lives of every person who comes into the human family. And whether they've actually heard the gospel the way it is preached in your ears, or simply been impressed by the unction of the Holy Spirit, to live their lives in a better way. If they respond to the work of the Holy Spirit, this is true for people who have never heard the name of Jesus, and it's equally true for people sitting in this room right now, or listening on Facebook right now. If we listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit and allow Him to guide us into the transformation that produces a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, in your life or in mine, then this verse is talking about us. There is no other way. This is the way. And responding in a positive way to the influence of the Holy Spirit qualifies you for the reality of this salvation in your own life. Exodus 25:32. Now please pay close attention. Six branches. So we have a candlestick. There's a central candlestick. And then three coming out of each side. Total of six. Six branches shall come out of its sides. Three branches of the lampstand on one side. Three branches of the lampstand on the other side. Out of the other side. Three bowls shall be made like almond blossoms on one branch with an ornamental knob and a flower. And three bowls made like almond blossoms blossoms on the other branch with an ornamental knob and a flower and so for the six branches that come out of the lampstand so every one of the six has three small bowls on it almond blossoms are symbolic also I, I'm not going to take a lot of time on this but when Aaron's rod budded if you're familiar with that story it produced almond blossoms and it produced almonds and it's a symbol for the power of God doesn't need nature to support it. The power of God supports nature. It didn't make any sense that an almond branch cut off from the tree would produce flowers and almonds. That was the power of God. And that's what's being symbolized in the almond blossom here. Right on the candlestick, which is the symbol for the light of the world. God's power will get it done. It's not a matter of us being able. It's a matter of us being willing. God's power will get it done. Three bowls made like almond blast blossoms on each of the six. And they are symbolic of the three areas of concern that the Holy Spirit has in the world today. The first is those who have accepted the gospel. He wants to maintain us. He wants to support us. He wants to continue our growth, our development, our transformation. And so they symbolize His power available to those of us who have accepted the gospel. And then there are those who accepted it, but they have backslidden. He hasn't written them off. He doesn't throw people away. 
they've backslidden. Okay, they need His power to get back. And that's why one of those bowls is a symbol for His love, His concern, His power for those who have backslidden from the Gospel. I have, listen, as I look over your faces, I'm not going to embarrass anybody, but I have people sitting in this room today who were backsliders. You're, you're listening to a sermon of a backslider. But the, the Holy Spirit didn't give up on me. And He didn't give up on you either. And He has what it takes. If we're willing, He's able. And then the third, those who have never heard the Gospel. His third area of concern. And He wants to flow through us into those areas. People who have never heard it. People who don't know it. Though it's all symbolized there in the three bowls on the branches. The central candlestick doesn't have the three smaller bowls. It's different. The middle candlestick is different. Does that mean that the Lord doesn't care about those three areas? No, it doesn't mean that. But the work of the last church is different. The last church has a different goal. We are to prepare the world for Christ's return. To prepare people for translation as well as resurrection. Now that word translation, some, some of you may be more familiar and comfortable with the word rapture. And as long as you don't attach the word secret to it, I'm okay with it. You can say rapture instead of translation. But I promise you, it will not be a secret when Jesus comes back. And the world is to be prepared for that. The first, the first five churches, they were to be used by the Holy Spirit to prepare the world for resurrection. There is a difference between resurrection and translation. We've already addressed this issue in part 14 of this series. It's archived on our Facebook. You can go to your Facebook page and click on our book, Revelation, verse by verse. That'll give you the playlist. Just go to number 14, listen to that sermon. I don't have time to re-preach it. But there is a difference between resurrection and translation. I promise you. And that is a biblical promise, not a human one. Exodus 25, 34, on the lampstand itself. This is on the base now. Four bowls shall be made like almond blossoms. Again, the power of God gets it done. Not anything we can offer. Each with its ornamental knob and flower. These bowls supply the oil for the lamps. Oil is a symbol for the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit flows from the four bowls through the lamp and lights the world. Do you, get, you see the symbolism, right? As described in Exodus 25, it may have looked something like this. You can see the six branches, the central branch, the small bowls on the six branches, <clears throat> the four bowls there on the uh, base of the candlestick. And we can actually name them. Look at the construction there. And this is the way it's described in Exodus. The two outer candlesticks, or really lamps is more appropriate, but the, the two outer lamps would be Ephesus, Smyrna. Do you see how they're fed by the same tube? Same tube between Ephesus and Smyrna. And that's what the description that we just read said. Each bowl supplies the oil for two branches of the candlestick. So the first bowl on the base, this is the four bowls on the base, the first bowl supplies the oil for the first two churches, Ephesus, Smyrna. And then we move in. How do I know we move from the outside in? Because the central one is the one that's different. The last church is the one that's different. So we begin on the outside and we move towards the last church. Ephesus, Smyrna. The next two in would be Pergamos, Thyatira. And then Sardis, Philadelphia. And then you get to the last church. So we can name the, the lamps on the candlestick when we consider the description of how it is manufactured. Exodus 25, verse 35. There shall be a knob under the first two branches of the same, 
a knob under the second two branches of the same, a knob under the third two branches of the same, according to the six branches that extend from the lampstand. So there's the picture, the word picture, and we've also seen the picture of it. This leaves the last large bowl exclusively for the last candlestick. And doesn't the Bible talk about the latter reign of the Holy Spirit? We've had the Holy Spirit in former reign power all through church history. But Jesus said in the last days, we would do greater things than he did. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? That we would do greater things than he did? Really? Come on. Really? I would argue with it, except he said it. And his word is with power. If he said it, it's going to be true. And that's exactly what is symbolized here in the candlestick. The fourth bowl, all of the oil, goes to one lamp. So what is symbolized by these four bowls? The Holy Spirit flows from them into the lives of all who will receive the gospel. There are four gospel commissions that the Holy Spirit works to spread. There are only four gospel commissions. Now, there, are, there is the possibility of somebody who really knows their Bible arguing this point with me because there seems to be a gospel commission in the book of Acts. But you have to understand, if you don't already know it, that Luke and Acts were one letter. And the, the gospel commission is the connection between the first part of the letter and the last part of the letter. As Luke was writing to Theophilus, the letter was becoming quite lengthy. If you've read the gospel of Luke, you know that it's a long letter. And when he got to the, what he perceived to be the middle of the letter, he said, well, I'm not going to make him wait to hear this. I'm going to go ahead and send him the first half of the letter and then I'll finish it and send him the second half. Well, the first half, came, first half came to be known as the Gospel of Luke. The second half came to be known as the Acts of the Apostles, but they are the same letter. And the connection is the Gospel Commission. So there are really only four in the Bible. And remember, each bowl supplies the oil, that is the Holy Spirit, for two periods of church history. So let's look at them. Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Notice the gospel signature. When the, when the Bible says this message is to go to everywhere, all the world, all the nations, that's the signature of a gospel commission. And notice that it refers to the entire Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All three are involved in our salvation. If you try to get rid of one of them, as many Christians are trying to negate the personal presence of the Holy Spirit as a personal entity, an individual entity, then you have thrown away your salvation. All three are involved in our salvation. Baptizing them in the name of the Father of the, and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe, observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is the only gospel commission that refers to the commandments of God. It's the only one of the four that mentions the commandments of God. Interestingly enough, it was at the end of the first two periods of church history, Ephesus and Smyrna, that the church decided it had a right to change God's law. Remember the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. The church decided they could make it the first day. Now when you consider that their gospel commission, the gospel commission that fed the two churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, 
their gospel commission was to teach the commandments of God, among other things, but they were to teach the commandments of God. So when they threw away or changed the commandments of God, they actually threw away their gospel commission. How do you teach the commandments of God when you've written different commandments? You don't even have the commandments of God anymore. You've thrown away your gospel commission. So there was a need for another one. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Again, notice the gospel signature. This is the signature of the gospel commission. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Salvation clearly is based on belief. And baptism. Salvation is initiated by baptism. It's based on belief, initiated by baptism. That's exactly what the commission says. This is the second gospel commission. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. The new birth brings new power into the Christian life. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. It brings protection. If you're the angel. Now, if you don't know why I said that or what that means, you haven't been listening to this whole series. Because every one of the letters, which covers the entire period of Christian history, was written to the angel of the church. And angel simply means messenger. If you're willing to share what God has shown you, if you're willing to spread the gospel, then you are the angel of the church. And if you are the angel, then this is for you. This protection, this power, God working through you, that's all guaranteed. His word proclaims it. You can take it to the bank. It'll draw interest better than any account you could put your money in. It will bring eternal life for the people that you share this with. It was during the Pergamos Thyatira period of church history, however, that the church decided that it could market salvation. Now we've looked at all this as we went through the seven letters. I, I don't have time to re-preach all of those things. So if you, if you have questions about why I say this, you need to go back and listen to those seven letters. We've got it all archived on Facebook. But the church decided it could market salvation and baptized by sprinkling. That's just what happened historically. And it matches perfectly with the symbolism of the candlestick and the four bowls that the oil flows from. You could pay for sin by doing penance, or you could buy forgiveness. You could even buy an indulgence for future sins. You could go to the priest and say, look, I'm going to go to a party this weekend, and I don't know, dude, I'm, I'm probably going to do some stuff. And I, I'm afraid I might, you know, I might die before I get back here to, you know, have confession with you. So what, what can I do to cover me? And the priest will say, well, what, I don't know, what do you think you're going to do this weekend? Well, there's going to be women there. There's going to be booze there. I figure, you know, I'm going to get involved in all that. And the priest will say, well, okay, write me a check for, well, they didn't write checks back then, but you understand, give me this much gold, this much silver, you can pay for it in advance, and you're covered. Your sins will be forgiven in advance. No, they won't. There's nothing in the Bible about that. Why would, why would somebody say that? Come on, you know enough about the human nature to understand why somebody would say, I'll forgive your sin if you give me enough money? I don't have to say it, do I? Greed. That's pure heresy. 
There's nothing in the Bible like that. And sprinkling, instead of immersing the baptismal candidate, loses the significance of dying to self so he or she can live for Christ. That symbolism is destroyed when you sprinkle instead of immersing. The Bible simply says in Acts 16, verse 31, they said, that is the apostles, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And thy house, in other words, thy family, you and your family will be, be saved if you will simply believe. And we've already read that. That's what the Gospel Commission said in Mark 16. Believe. When they started selling salvation, they threw that away along with their Gospel Commission. So then we come to Luke. Chapter 24 and verse 44. Now, I've gotten a little bit excited here, which means my throat's drying out. Forgive me, but I need a drink of water. I had to say that for the people on radio. Everybody who's here and everybody on Facebook knows I have a bottle of water. But the people on radio, they might have said, what? He needs a what? <laughs> then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. That's the way they used to say the Old Testament. That's what that is. The law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, that's the Old Testament. And he opened their understanding, verse 45, that they might comprehend the scripture. Now that's the other way they said the Old Testament. At this time there was no New Testament. Luke is in the process of writing a part of the New Testament, but there is no New Testament. And so he's referring to the Old Testament. Then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached to, in his name to all the nations, there's the gospel signature, beginning at Jerusalem. It was after Sardis, Philadelphia, that dispensationalism became the popular reason for the great disappointment of 1844. We're going to talk more about that next week. I, I'm not, I just don't have the time to spend explaining that entirely today. But you can look it up in your encyclopedia or get it on Google. It, there was a thing called the Great Disappointment. And it's because people all over the world, in America, in Europe, all over the place, were preaching an interpretation of Daniel, chapter, chapters 7, 8, and 9, that seemed to indicate that Christ would return on October 22, 1844. And they set that date. In spite of the fact that the Bible says no man knows the day or the hour, they set that date. And when he didn't come, there was a great disappointment. Huge disappointment. And people responded to it in various ways. Some decided that nothing in the Bible could be depended upon and they just walked away from religion altogether. Some decided they had misunderstood the time prophecy and they started setting new dates. And some of them are still setting dates. We had, a, we had a date set, wasn't it last year? Somebody said Jesus was coming on a certain date last year. Was it in September or something like that? So there are still people doing it. But then there was another group who said, we need to restudy. We must not have understood. We know we can rely upon God's word. So the fault must be ours. We didn't get it right. And they went back and they studied again. And they found out exactly what was meant by this prophecy. And as I said, I don't have time to preach that to you today, but we will look at that, I promise you, we will look at that in depth in the very near future. The Bible says, the New Testament says, in 2 Timothy 3, 16, and when this was written, there was no New Testament. When Paul wrote this letter to Timothy, there was no New Testament. He was talking about the Old Testament. And he said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God 
and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And so when they explained away the disappointment of 1844 by saying, well, the Old Testament, that was for the Jews. We are New Testament Christians. We're saved by grace. They were saved by works. We're saved by grace. And so we don't really need the Old Testament anymore. That's been done away with. We're New Testament Christians. That, that was the basic response to the great disappointment. That was what the theologians of the day in some of the mainstream churches began to preach. This is why there was a disappointment. We didn't understand the Old Testament's been done away with. We don't have to worry about any of that stuff. We're New Testament Christians. We're saved by grace. Well, we are saved by grace. But you don't get to throw away more than half of the Bible. All of the Bible is the Word of God. And we need to understand every bit of it. And the Holy Spirit is here to bring that understanding to us. So when they threw out the Old Testament, guess what? They threw away their Gospel Commission, which told them to preach from the Old Testament. I mean, that's what their Gospel Commission said. From the Old Testament, show my Gospel. They threw it away. So there was a need for another Gospel Commission. The last Gospel Commission will correct the three errors involving the first three Gospel Commissions. And it will do it in reverse order. In perfect reverse order. So let's take a look. Are you still with me? Yes. Have I put anybody to sleep? You need, if I did, you need to wake up. Because this is where it meets, this is where the rubber meets the road, right here. This is the last gospel commission. Revelation 14, 6. It's written by John, but it's not written in the Gospel of John. It's written by John on the Isle of Patmos in the book of Revelation. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Of the four gospel commissions, this is the most complete signature of any of the gospel commissions. You've looked at all of them here in the last few minutes. You've looked at all the gospel commission signatures. This is the most complete one. And to my way of thinking, to my mind, this is just an indicator that God knew all along the first three were going to be thrown away. Why, why do I have to get of any detail to the first three in the signature? They're going to throw them away. This is the one that doesn't get thrown away. And he gives us the most complete gospel signature. This goes to every nation, every tribe. You understand the difference. Every nation, you know, that could leave out a lot of people. But no, we've got to go to every tribe within that nation. And then it narrows it even more. Every tongue. Every different language. You know, some nations have a lot of different... Even Texas. We don't speak English here. We speak Texican here. Anyway, enough for the humor. But it, it says every language, every tongue. And if that doesn't get it, if that doesn't cover it, let's go a little bit closer. Every people. Now, you need to understand that word as person. You see, we've narrowed it down. Every nation, every tribe, every tongue. Well, just in case that didn't get it, every person. The gospel goes to every person. And that's what the word people should have been translated as. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel. Hey, it hasn't changed. It's the same for the Old Testament it is for the New Testament. Read Hebrews chapter 13, the faith chapter. By faith, Noah. Was Noah in the Old Testament or the New Testament? Yeah. By faith, Enoch. By faith, Moses. By faith, Abraham. Those are all Old Testament. They're not saved by works. 
Nobody's going to work their way into heaven. I don't care when they lived on this earth. It's the same gospel for everybody. Always has been, always will be. Nothing can change it. There is no dispensationalism. And the third theological error that the Christian church made has now been corrected by this gospel commission. Do you see it? All right. I must have put you to sleep. Do you see it? Well, that heartens me. Maybe I can go on now. Saying with a loud voice, fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. It's His judgment because He alone reads the heart. He's the only one who can judge. Man looks on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. It's His judgment. It's not your pocketbook, and it's not your works, and it's not your penance. It's what God reads in your heart. And that's the second theological error now corrected by this Gospel Commission. Worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. That language is lifted right out of the fourth commandment. And the fourth commandment is the only place in the Bible that tells you how to worship God as creator. I know I've said this to you enough times that you think I'm bragging now, but I just, I can't help it. I'm not bragging. But I've read the Bible through 30 times, all the way through. I'm reading it through in the Hebrew Bible right now. But I've read all the modern translations. I've read the King James. I've read the New King James. I've read all of them all the way through. I've done that 30 times. There's no place in the Bible that tells you how to worship God as Creator except the fourth commandment. That's it. Amen. And that's the one they changed. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. I have to pause here. This is God writing in stone with his own finger. And he says he did it in six days. Do you need to know anything else about it? He says he did it in six days. Does he have a reason to lie to us? Could we, could we somehow do something to him if he happened to take 18 days instead of six days? Could we punish him for taking so long? There's absolutely no reason for him to mislead us. He's telling us the truth. He is the truth. And he says he did it in six days. The sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The first theological error has now been corrected, all three, by the fourth gospel commission in exact reverse order. The Sabbath day, not a day of your choosing. Why is it so important? I, you know, I talk to people who go to church on Sunday and they'll say, what is the big deal with you guys? All I hear from you is Sabbath day, Sabbath day, Sabbath day. What's the big deal with the Sabbath day? The Ten Commandments are an amazing piece of literature. But they're more than that. They are the government of God written down. They are the expression of his love, written in stone with his own finger. And nine of them, you can make yourself obey. You can, you can make yourself obey the Sabbath. You don't have to go out and do something else on the seventh day of the week. You can make yourself obey it. The one that you can't obey is the Tenth Commandment. Thou shalt not covet. That's the one 
that transitions to the law written in your heart, the Tenth Commandment. You see, coveting means <laughs> if you're not going to covet, there's been a miracle performed in your heart. And there's nothing you can do to, to enact that. It's a miracle of God. You were born covetous. You remain covetous until he works that miracle. And so the Tenth Commandment is different because of that. It transitions us to the law written upon our heart. But the Fourth Commandment is special too. Because it's the only one of the ten that doesn't make sense. The rest are all just a product of logic. It's logical that I shouldn't kill people because, duh, I don't want to be killed by people. It's logical that I shouldn't steal from people because, duh, I don't want to be stolen from by people. It is logical that I should honor my parents, duh. You getting tired of me saying duh? Okay, I'll quit. I, I want my children to honor me, don't I? See, that's just all logic. As a matter of fact, you can get nine of the commandments reading Plato, Greek philosopher. It's just logic, sheer logic. That's all it is. There's only one commandment that tests our faith. Let me ask you this. Imagine a father with a son, and he gives his son two jobs to perform. And he says, son, you just turned 16, so you have your driver's license now, and I want you to go to town and get a dozen donuts and bring them back, and you and I will eat them. Here's the money. And I also want you to clean up the garage. And the garage is a mess. I mean, it's got stuff in there that's been there ever since they moved there. And the dad says, I want you to clean it up enough that we can get both cars in the garage tomorrow morning. And the kid does it. He does both jobs. Now, when he went to town and got the donuts, did that prove that he was an obedient son? Did it? No, it didn't. He wanted, I mean, 16 years old, he just got his driver's license. Dad hands him the keys to the car and money for donuts? Come on. He wanted to do that. Cleaning up the garage. That proved he was an obedient son. There's no 16-year-old in the world that wants to clean up his dad's garage. And the Sabbath is like that. Now, for me, it's a fantastic day. I love the Sabbath. I get to stand up here and pontificate and you all come and listen to me. That's just... I can't imagine that, but I love it. I absolutely love it. But even if that weren't the case, if I didn't get to stand up here and you didn't come to listen to me, I love the Sabbath because of my relationship and my walk with Jesus Christ. He is my very best friend. He has my back. I, I wish I had time to tell you story after story after story how he has just saved me over and over and over again from my own foolishness. The Sabbath is the day that tests our loyalty. Amen. It's the day that tests our faith in His Word. It's the only one of the ten that doesn't make sense. How do you make sense of it? God said it was holy, but it tastes the same. The air breathes the same. The sun shines the same. The rain falls the same. Nothing is different. I just have God's word for it. It's the only one of the ten. And do you know, in Luke 18, verse 8, Jesus told us what his greatest concern was. He said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? That's his greatest concern. Will I find faith when I come back? And the Sabbath is the only commandment that provides assurance to him that we trust his word. These three messages that we just looked at, 
clarify the truth about who God is. The everlasting gospel means he's fair to all. Imagine a father who treats one son one way and another son a different way. What kind of a father would that be? An unfair father. And that's not our God. Old Testament, New Testament makes no difference. God is fair to all. The hour of his judgment. Now, I haven't had time to cover this yet. We're going to talk more about it. But when we look at it in depth, we're going to learn that his judgment includes our opportunity to review what he has done. And that is a revelation of his character of love. He gives us the last word on his judgment. Worshiping the creator means we believe the Christian hope is real. You cannot separate the creatorship of God from his resurrection power. The resurrection of my grandmother and my grandfather and my sister killed in a car wreck when she was 39 years old. That's my Christian hope. And if God cannot create by divine fiat, he cannot resurrect the dead. We worship him as creator and that means we believe in the Christian hope. He wrote it in stone. His love written in stone. He wrote it in stone with his own finger and then he came to this earth and he lived it for three and a half years. He lived it for three and a half years. And Paul said, thereby he established the law. We looked at that, I think it was last week or the week before, one of those, we looked at that verse. He established the law. He didn't do away with it, he established it. And then, having written it in stone, he gave us the red letter edition at Calvary. He wrote his love in stone, and then he wrote it in blood. He sealed it with his own life. He certified that everything he promised was ours for the asking, ours for the accepting. Resurrection morning is very near. He is trusting us to deliver three messages to the world. The gospel is everlasting. Judgment belongs to God. And God wants to be worshipped as creator. There isn't another denomination. I don't say this in a proud way. I'm just stating the fact. There's not another denomination that preaches what you heard here today. This is the only denomination that preaches the three angels' message of, well, actually, the three messages of the first angel of Revelation 14, 6, and 7. There's not another church that preaches this. We are... And I do not say this in a proud way. Please do not misunderstand me. But we are fulfilling prophecy today in this room right now as this message is proclaimed in your ears. Revelation 14, 6, and 7 is the last gospel commission. Pray with me. Father, we thank you that you haven't given up on any of us. Your love... Is so wonderful, so far beyond our understanding. There is absolutely nothing any of us could do to make you love us more or to make you love us less. Your love for each and every one is perfect as it is. And your offer of salvation is all-inclusive. There's not a person on this planet that you're not including in that offer of love. We will never meet one solitary individual anywhere on the face of planet Earth that you are not desperately in love with. So much so that you would rather die than spend eternity without that person. And you have asked us to be your arms, your lips, your expression of love to the people around us. Let them see you shining in our lives. Let them sense your great concern for them as it is expressed in our life 
and our concern for them. Let us be that fourth messenger, that fourth message to a dying world. Let us accept the gospel commission for this time and carry it to everyone we meet, everywhere we go, in your power. Not because we can do it, not because we're somehow special or we're able or or we're smart or we're morally a superior. No, not for any of those reasons. But simply because we're willing and you're able, let it be done. In us we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.